It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. G'day, it's Dr. Justin Coulson. Every Wednesday, I get to have a conversation with somebody uh, really interesting about stuff that applies to what we're supposed to be doing as parents so that we can help our kids to thrive and flourish. Kylie doesn't join me for these interviews, but uh, but today uh, I have somebody who can amply uh, fill her space with some incredible insights and ideas. Uh, today, speaking with Dr. Catherine Ball. Uh, Catherine is a scientific Futurist. She's a tech influencer. Uh, Catherine and I actually shared the TED stage at TEDx Melbourne about five years ago. Uh, Catherine is a drone expert uh, and an associate professor, among a million other things. Oh, and a mum to two kids, aged four and two. Dr. Catherine Ball, thanks for joining me on the Happy Families podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. How are you going? Yeah, super. And and excited to be able to uh, spend some time chatting with you again. Uh, Catherine, the, the central question of this podcast really is uh, girls and STEM. This is your area of expertise. And th- I know that there are going to there are going to be some people who are listening to this conversation going, this is not the typical Happy Families podcast. This mm. is not where we normally play. These are not the typical things that we talk about. Mm. But I would imagine that many people will be going – what does it matter whether it's boys or girls who are doing the science and the tech and the engineering and the maths? Who, who, who really cares? So long as someone's doing it, so long as we can get our, our trains to work, our bridges to be built, our astronauts to fly, our planes to stay up in the sky, does it really matter if it's male or female? What's the big deal with girls in STEM? Why are our schools making such a big deal about it? Why are there businesses out there who are profiting from it? Does it really matter? Can you respond to those people who might be asking those uh, that, that kind of a question? And, and they're asking it sincerely. It's not like there's any sort of sexist mm. motive behind it. They're kind of, d- does it actually matter? Why the big deal? Well, I would suggest there's probably an unconscious or subconscious sexism that's basically been cold fed to everybody by drip method um, called the patriarchy that we've been living in for the last few thousand years. So if you, I don't know if you've ever done the Harvard Am I Sexist test, Um, As a father of six girls, I think you would find it enlightening because as the raging feminist and egalitarian person that I am, um, even I slipped up to the point where I saw women at home and men at work. And I was very desperately upset. And I called my mom and I was like, how is this? This does not reflect the things that I care about, how I act, my how I work, how I live, how I play. And she said, Catherine, what do you think you've been brought up in? You're having to undo all of that stuff of not seeing women on the television, just seeing women as sex objects, just seeing token women, not seeing women speak, not seeing women speak to each other about something other than a man. All of those things that we've been imbibing. So if someone said to me, why is the bother? Why do we want care about gender equality? What on earth should we care? Why on earth should we care about it? Well, part of me would like to say, would you like to find a solution to climate change? Would you like to feed the next billion people that are going to be on this planet? Would you like to have a fair and equitable political world, which doesn't need a civil war to then actually put gender diversity into our politicians representing us? Like, would you want to If I flip the coin, if I said to you right now, I'm going to force this so you are 10% men working in these jobs and 90% women in these jobs, how would that feel as a world to you if you were not represented? And gender is only one of the levers around representation. Gender, you'd like to think, is probably one of the most obvious and easiest levers which we could switch. But even now, looking at the gaping jaws of defeat graph that I referred to in my TED talk, it's going to take us 200 years to get gender equality in the way that we deserve to have it. We deserve deserve to have a society that is based in technology, in medicine, in politics, in economics, in finance, in um, you know international development and aid work that represents every single drop of intellectual cap- capability in this country. And unless you have gender equality, you are fishing from a half pool. And there's no way that I would suggest it's logical for anyone to not recognize the value of every single brain being around the table when it comes to gnarly and difficult decisions. If I was to put that in a nutshell, I would say, if you are even thinking that there's a there's a, a, a reason why we don't need girls in STEM or we don't want gender equality, then you need to check yourself because you are sexist and you do not recognize the state of the world. You do not recognize the levels of family and domestic violence that are directly caused by a lack of respect, which starts with you know, a lack of representation and respect, which comes from where? You know, It comes from generations and generations, or it comes from the society around us. If we had better gender representation across the board in Australia, we would have a happier, healthier, more economically successful society. And I can't see a single argument against that that I would pass the pub test with. I think that the best way that we can utilise your incredible brain in this conversation is to just talk about what parents of girls specifically, but kids generally, need to hear when it comes to 
helping their kids to find that thing and maybe even to move into those STEM areas where, let's face it, Australia could probably do a little bit, a little bit better. We're looking for more opportunities here. There's, there's a future out there that too many Australian brains are not taking part in when they need to. How do we move our kids in that direction as long as they've got the slightest proclivity? Well, if people want to follow up with me and my social media, I, I've got lots of um, further information on that. I know we don't have time to talk about all of it today. My one big ask is this. There are two facts you need to keep in your mind when you think about the opportunities that you have for your kids in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years when they get going in their in their careers. Most of the jobs that currently exist in the next 20 years will not. So what we have to actually look at are the skills and the aptitude that we breed into our kids and we build into our kids and that resilience and that ability for them to adapt and learn and change. There's been so much push for coding in the classroom, but we know now that AI is going to be the thing that's writing the code, not us. So what we actually need are people that can talk to artificial intelligence. We need the William Shakespeare's of the world, the Sylvia Plath's of the world. We need the ability to talk to technology and have technology do what it is that we need to do. So how do you breed that into someone? Well, languages. For me, coding was only ever a language. So you might have a child who you think, well, they're really into languages. They're really into art. What on earth are they going to have in a technological future? Well, quite frankly, they're the people that are going to build the metaverse. One of the key things that we have that's going on with technology at the moment is we're all becoming consumers. We're not becoming curators, creators, or engineers. And this is the rise of new cybernetics. So the idea of where humans, technology, and the environment converge, this is where magic is going to happen. And Steve Jobs predicted this 20 years ago, before Mark Zuckerberg had even thought about using social media to track down single women on campus. Um, and so if we look at the skills that you might want to present to any of your children, regardless of their genders, is the opportunity for them to flourish in the things that they care about because everything human is going to have value. Everything automated is going to be automated. To be able to approach a problem with a creative mindset and a systems-led way of thinking are the absolute needs that we have even right now in industry. So we know uh, so that's stage one. So allow them to do what they love, allow them to be creative and don't think that an English degree is going to stop them working in technology or an arts degree is going to stop them working in technology because every job is going to be working in technology in 10 years time. I, I have to stop you before you go on to point two. I'm so <laughs> I, no, no, I'm so glad that you said that because I've got a daughter who loves English and just mm. the other day I was saying to her, go to uni, do mm -hmm. arts, do English. And she said, mm. but what's the point? What am I going to do with that? You and, need her. And I, and I was saying to her, the, the skills that you will learn, the creativity, the analytical thought, the, the, the yeah. critical way of analysing and, and working through problems, the knowledge that you'll gain as an English major. I mean, it's such a yep. weird thing to study at uni. Not, people go and do business or accounting or they go and do IT or whatever it is but, or psychology. But I said, English is your thing. It's what mm -hmm. lights you up. Don't worry about the career. Who cares about the career? It will sort itself out if you find what you love. When the pandemic hit, where did we all turn? We all turned to the arts. I was so desperately upset that they weren't better supported because we all straight away went to streaming services. We went to live opera streaming services. We went to, you know, watching people singing alone in pubs. We, you know, we tried, we went to the arts. We went to who we are. And I remember Winston Churchill, I think um, in World War II, someone said something about him moving all of the British Museum things into some of the London underground stations. And they were like, well, what on earth do you care about this kind of old dusty artwork for? And he said, what do you think we're fighting for? We're fighting for who we are and who we are in literary concepts and constructs for me is incredibly important. And I'd like to you to uh, send your daughter looking for Professor Genevieve Bell's work, because at the moment, um, Professor Genevieve is looking at the new cybernetics and she's actually looking backwards in time to find the very first moments where cybernetics and the metaverse were ever discussed. And it goes all the way back to 1851 to the London Winter's Fair. So if your daughter wants to get involved in the future, she needs to understand the past and she needs to understand the past of language and of creation and of environment and what it is to be human, not what it is to be able to fill out an Excel spreadsheet. Everything's connected. I love this. Everything is connected. What's point two? <laughs> so point two is you need to be a bit active, right? So though you might have a child who's really engaged in the visual arts, for example, has your daughter ever tried, um, you know, writing a poem using an AI code? Has she ever um, participated in an after-school camp or got involved with a school holiday program where she's maybe going out onto country in Australia and learning from people that speak different languages? Has she ever looked at history from a different set of eyes? Has she traveled? Has she, will she backpack? Will she take a gap year? Um, some of your other um, daughters might be more technologically minded. Where are they doing their work experience? Have you bought a VR headset so your artist children can maybe paint as a virtual, virtual reality artists is a thing now, by the way. Um, so what I'm saying here is you need to spend time and 
money on not only allowing your children to be who they are, but actually to push them down the rabbit holes of where these technologies are coming out of. This could be as simple as you might not like coding. You might not like tech and that's fine because you've got a whole load of other friends that you can shove into this, right? So you might have a cousin, a brother, an aunt, a best mate, somebody who your child trusts and has a really solid relationship with. And they can go and do a Girl Geek Academy coding camp, for example, where both of them learn to code and both of them work on a project so that your daughter then has a mentor that's back in her regular life away from school that she can talk to about coding. She can talk to about algorithms. She can talk to about machine learning. Um, and they have a relationship built around this absorption of technology. Okay. So two points. Number one, make sure your kids are are pursuing their passions and number two, steer them into the tech avenues that that build out from that. And if it's not you, uh, in, invite them to investigate it themselves, which kind of flies in the face of so much of the advice out there that your kids have got to get off screens, right? Because this is where they're going to learn it. This is where they're going to do it. Uh, if there's any other things that parents could be doing to, I mean, do you know what? I'm interrupting myself here. I can't help it. <laughs> anyone who says that, uh, and I don't know anyone who does say this, but but there's this stereotype that's still out there that, uh, I don't know, g- girls don't do engineering, for example. Oh, you can look around um, a university course and all the all the guys are there. There's only two mm-hmm. girls in the room or whatever it is. I'm listening mm-hmm. to what you're saying, Catherine, and if even if parents are listening to this and going, I have no idea what she's actually saying, <laughs> and I'm sure that there will be a few who are going, whoa, what happened here? What happened to the, the podcast? Uh, my sense is that anybody who's listening to you can, number one, they they know that you know what you're talking about and that you're uh, that you're female surprise i mean uh, this this is this is 2022 and this is doable and it's supposed to be there for everybody and and the passion and the excitement and the interest that you have in this is contagious. I feel like my energy level has lifted about <laughs> seven notches since we began the conversation just because i i can hear it coming out of you if there was one last thing that parents could do other than direct their kids in those into those avenues, even if they don't know what they are themselves and, and have them experimenting them and using their screens and, and the technologies productively going down these 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 different rabbit holes. Uh, what, what's the last uh, take-home message that you might give to parents around girls, STEM, and not downplaying their intelligence? I really think you need to work with your schools. So we have so many amazing principals, deputy principals, um, Uh, career counsellors, STEM teachers, language teachers, geography teachers, history teachers. And the reason why people go into teaching is because they're actually futurists. And so your children are exposed to futurists every day when they go to school. They are literally in, they put their brains into the hands of people who have got decades of training and experience to help them see the world in a different way and maybe look at over the edges of the horizon as to where that world is going to go. So as a parent, if you really feel like your child needs to experience something new or learn something different, engage with your school and discuss it and work out how's the best way to actually add value to the whole school community. Kids going into school, learning learning something in a classroom and coming home again is not how this is going to stick. It's not how any of this is going to change. Going into a classroom, seeing something from the real world, seeing things from a futurist point of view, getting involved in brand new projects, working with industry, work experience. Um, So adding value to what is already happening without adding pressure. I think is 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 probably my final ask. Now, they would sit there and go, well, how the heck am I going to do that? Because the school obviously has this great program and this, that and the other. Have you ever talked to the teachers about what they might like to do? Have you ever talked to the principal about what's coming up on the horizon um, and how we can help? So you might be a small business owner um, and you might sell cars, for example. Um, well, if you haven't heard of blockchain, you're going to hear about it pretty soon. And if you don't have a website, you're probably not selling very many cars. And if you don't understand search engine optimization, you're probably not doing so well. So it's like if you want to have success, even in your own business, engaging with technology and engaging with the way young people engage with technology, you deserve to have a look at this too. Nobody's obsolete yet. Nobody's obsolete full stop. And one of the things that really bothers me about big tech and some of the power differentials we're seeing is that you're almost creating two parts of society, one of which that engages with this and the other which which is obsolete. And I don't want to see obsolescence across society anywhere. Catherine, there's a lot of parents, a lot of school teachers, school principals, school counsellors, uh, people who listen to this podcast who will be, their minds may just be exploding with <laughs> ideas based on what we've discussed just now. If they'd like to continue the conversation with you, how can they contact you? On every single piece of social media, I am at Dr. Catherine Ball. So you can find me on everything. Great. And that's Catherine That's Catherine with a C and an I N E. C H E R I N E B A L L as in football. Dr. Catherine Ball, what a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. 
Oh, thanks so much. I could I could just keep going and I'm really glad that you're keeping me short today because it's very hot up here in Queensland at the moment. So I hope everyone's staying safe and well. And uh, yeah, just look, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the future. Thanks, Catherine. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Ruan from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And if you'd like more info about the stuff we talked about, check out the show notes for the podcast. You can visit at Dr. Catherine Ball on all the social medias or to make your family happier, check us out at happyfamilies.com.au. Listener.